So I'm just going to cover sort of general principles of transfusion, including indications and blood product selection. We're going to talk about aluminization and, and monitoring and reducing the risk of hemolytic transfusion reactions. I'll then go on to talk about hemolytic transfusion reactions management and high premolysis, and then also um, present some summaries, case summaries, and some shot data as well. So many patients with sickle cell disease will require transfusion at some stage across the lifespan. However, the decision to transfuse can be very challenging and it's often described as a balancing act with the potential benefits um, and the goals of transfusion, including increasing oxygen carrying capacity and reducing the proportion of hemoglobin S containing red blood cells. And so um, transfusion is given to prevent um, the progression of acute complications and also for primary and secondary prevention of sickle cell related complications. However, there are significant risks, most commonly red cell aluminization and hemolytic transfusion reactions, and also transfusion related iron overload. So these are sort of the general principles of transfusion. I think it's important to say that transfusion can be time critical and when it's required in an emergency, it is required urgently. It's very important to, to establish an indication for transfusion and avoid unnecessary transfusion, which sounds very obvious, but certainly from the work I've been doing with SHOT, it's clear to see that sometimes transfusion is given when it's not always required. It's important to try and minimise the risk of aluminization and hemolytic transfusion reactions and avoid hyperviscosity as well. And the viscosity of blood containing sickle cells is much higher than that of normal red blood cells. Um, and therefore, when you transfusion, it's important to consider the hemoglobin concentration and the um, percentage of sickle hemoglobin in order to maximise oxygen delivery to tissues without increasing the overall blood viscosity. So there are clear guidelines on transfusion. The BSH guidelines are from 2016, and then more recently, there's also been American Society of Hematology guidelines in 2020. And these are the sort of indications from the BSH guidance. And many of these recommendations are conditional due to the lack of high certainty evidence, but they include the indications where the primary goal is to correct the anemia, so your aplastic crises, um, and other, other times when the hemoglobin is generally lower. And then there are the indications for um, where the primary goal is to reduce the concentration of hemoglobin S, and it's where it, this is where exchange is more commonly recommended. Um, and then we have good evidence for stroke um, prevention and also for prevention of complications um, for patients undergoing surgery. Um, and then there are high risk pregnancies where transfusion would be considered as well. So there's no single hemoglobin S target that sort of covers all indications, um, but studies have demonstrated a reduction in complications with various targets. And the hemoglobin S target will depend on several factors, including the indication for transfusion, as well as the patient's disease severity and the severity of their current acute illness um, and any organ dysfunction as well. And I think as a sort of pragmatic approach, a target of hemoglobin S less than 30 is often recommended for acute com complications such as chest syndrome and stroke and multi-organ failure. So in terms of blood product selection, there are a number of um, criteria and um, there is scope for error at each stage, really. So it's when deciding to transfuse a patient, it's very important to inform the laboratory of the diagnosis, but also to make sure that the person you're speaking to in the lab is aware of the special requirements for patients with sickle cell disease. It's important to check with the patient about any history of transfusion reactions, um, particularly for patients who are being treated outside of their normal base hospital. It's important to check with um, their base hospital and the national um, reference database, which is SPICE in England, to see if there's any history of alloantibodies. It's important to ensure the patient has had a baseline extended phenotype done prior to transfusion, and then it's important to provide extended RH and Kel match units, as well as antigen negative blood for any corresponding antigen, um, and in ensure the blood is hemoglobin S negative as well. And we generally try to use fresh blood, so we say less than 10 days all for simple transfusion, less than seven days all for exchange, but um, we can be a little bit lenient with this, especially when it's difficult to find blood for patients. 
So red cell aluminization is one of the major complications and the incidence um, reported does vary. Most recent reports do suggest a lower incidence um, in, in, in lowering, it, sorry, since the introduction of extended RH and CalMAC units. Um, but the incidence does vary depending on factors such as patient age and red cell exposure. Sorry, I think somebody has just joined needs to go on mute because it's, um, it's causing a bit of background noise there. Thank you. Um, and then one of the contributing factors to the aluminization risk is due to the ethnic variations within the red cell antigen expression between donor and recipients. And this is further complicated by the significant heterogeneity in the RH gene in individuals from Black, African and Caribbean backgrounds. And therefore, some individuals do develop RH antigens despite receiving um, what appears to be RH matched blood. And this is why genotyping can be useful to provide more accurate antigen profiles for both donors and recipients where possible. So once patients do become aluminized, it can be more difficult to find suitable blood and can make um, it, it more likely that hemolytic transfusion reactions will occur. It's important to also say that alloantibodies can be transient and therefore when a patient has no detectable antibody on the routine screen, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't have a historic antibody which could still um, cause a hemolytic transfusion reaction. Slides are frozen now. Um, so, monitoring for aluminization and hemolytic transfusion reactions. So, it is recommended in the guidance if a patient has had an episodic transfusion, they should go on to have an antibody screen. Um, it isn't clear when's the best time to do this, but certainly I think the next time the patient is seen um, in a clinic or you know wherever you see the patient, it is best to send off another antibody screen. Um, and it's important that patients are involved in the decision making process regarding transfusion and made aware of the significant risks and also made aware of potential signs to look out for potential hemolytic transfusion reactions. So in terms of management of aluminization, if um, a DAT is positive, it's important to ask the lab to perform an LU8 to try and identify a new antibody. And samples are often referred to the regional red cell reference laboratory to aid with the antibody identification, particularly in complex cases. It's important then that any new antibodies are added to the um, national database um, patient record and the patient should be issued with a, with a card as well. Um, the American Society of Hematology guidance has issued their um, sort of 10 recommendations, again, which are mainly conditional due to the lack of um, good evidence, but they are similar to the BSH recommendations. There are a few extra recommendations here which have been included, including um, saying genotyping is preferred and um, to provide additional information. And it also recommends that extended red cell antigen matching may provide further protection. So ex extended matching for um, Kid, Duffy and S. And it also um, makes makes the point that if a patient does have a GATA mutation, which would be, would be picked up on um, genotyping, that we know that that patient is not a true null phenotype, and then they're not at risk of develop, developing anti-Duffy B. There is also then the ICTMG guidelines, which are international guidance, which um, again sort of make the same recommendations. Firstly, with regard to um, patients with sickle cell should receive the full RH and CalMatch units, which I think is generally recommended now. It also recommends that if patients have one or more clinically significant antibody, they should, should receive antigen negative blood. And then the third one, which is slightly different to what is currently in the UK recommendations, is that once a patient has one or more antibody, they should probably receive further extended matching for um, Duffy, Kid and S as well to try and reduce the risk further um, when this is, it's also when um, this extended matching is feasible and wouldn't cause undue delay. So hemolytic transfusion reactions are a significant problem with an estimated incidence of between 4 and 11 percent in patients receiving transfusion for sickle cell. Typical symptoms would be fever, jaundice and anemia and the um, presentation can often mimic uh, sickle cell acute painful crisis and therefore sometimes there is a delay in diagnosis. And then hyperhemolysis is a 
sort of unique form of hemolytic transfusion reaction in which there is evidence of both donor and autologous red cell destruction. And based on the current understanding, um, it does appear to be a bit of a spectrum of um, a disease with different varying presentations, but the reaction can be acute or delayed. There may or may not be antibody detected using current laboratory techniques. Um, and classically, the post-transfusion hemoglobin is lower than the pre-transfusion hemoglobin. And one of the most difficult problems is that further transfusion may exacerbate the hemolysis, so it can be very difficult when a patient's um, severely anemic. And then the pathogenesis remains poorly understood, but there are a number of sort of proposed mechanisms. The first one is a bystander hemolysis in which there is antibody destruction of both antigen positive cells, but then destruction of antigen negative cells. And it's thought that because sickle cells are more susceptible to complement, then this is why it's more common in sickle cell disease. There is also um, cases where there's been evidence of autoantibody formation. And again, this is thought to be in the context of an alloantibody which binds to the red cell, which then causes a conformational change in the antigen epitope signaling, which leads to autoantibody production. And then there's also uh, many cases which have demonstrated evidence of macrophage activation with um, hyperferritinemia and reticular cytopenia. And it has also been demonstrated on um, bone marrow at post mortem as well. So in terms of management of both delayed hemolytic transfusion and hyperhemolysis, it's best to avoid further transfusion and provide supportive care with hematinic support and erythropoietin. And when there's ongoing hemolysis, you'd re be recommended to give steroids and um, intravenous immunoglobulin. And then there is NHS England commissioning um, policy on the use of rituximab and ecolizumab of, as of 2020. So for second line treatment for an acute um, delayed hemolytic transfusion or hyperhemolysis, so this is where there's ongoing hemolysis despite IVIG and steroid, it's recommended to give ecolizumab and this can be repeated at day seven. And then rituximab is also recommended um, as third line. And then for prevention for patients who've failed steroid and immunoglobulin and a patient is anticipated to need further transfusion, it's recommended um, to give rituximab. So SHOT is the, um, the UK independent haemovigilance scheme and it's responsible for collecting and analysing data on adverse events related to um, blood components with the aim of improving transfusion safety. Um, so reports are submitted to SHOT and submitted via SABRE, which is the MHRA's um, online reporting system. And this map just shows the number of submitted um, reports for 2020 by um, and, and the number of components, the number of reports and components um, by country. And it's generally considered that participation is um, high, but it does vary by organisation. However, the number of reports, as you can see on the graph, is um, increasing year on year, despite taking into consideration the number um, of reports per component transfused. Um, and these are the most, so this is between 2020, 2010 and 2019, the most commonly reported events are hemolytic transfusion reactions and specific requirements not being met. And um, I'm sure you can appreciate there is some overlap between the two categories as one often leads to the other. And we have looked um, at the data from the last 10 years. Um, and the total number of hemolytic transfusion reactions in sickle was 93, and this actually makes up 22% of all hemolytic transfusion reactions that have been reported. And there were 50 cases of hyperhemolysis in sickle cell, um, and that was 92% of all of the hyperhemolysis cases um, reported to SHOT. And there's been a total of five deaths related to um, hemolytic transfusion reactions in sickle as well. And these are some of the sort of key findings. Um, I'm not sure if that second bit showed up on the slide. Um, sorry, yes, it has now. So 76% um, of all reports of hemolytic transfusion reactions were in females, and then 66% of all reports were um, in the context of an urgent transfusion. And this is consistent with what's previously been reported in the literature as well. And then the chart just shows the 
the indication for each transfusion. And as you can see, 12% of all of the transfusion were associated with a pregnancy as well. Um, and that, I thought this was quite interesting. You can see that for all of the acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, which occurred within 24 hours of transfusion, all of these occurred in the context of an urgent transfusion. And um, four of these were associated with a new aloe antibody. And then looking at the aloe immunization rates, so in all of the cases, there was evidence of previous aloe immunization in 40% of the reports, and there was a previous hemolytic transfusion reaction in 8%, and 44% of cases had a new antibody, and these are the most frequently reported antibodies. And then when we looked at the hyperhemolysis cases, we compared them to the hemolytic transfusion reactions. Um, there were similar rates of previous aloeimmunization between the hyperhemolysis and hemolytic transfusion reaction groups. Um, interestingly, 14% of the hyperhemolysis had reported a previous hemolytic transfusion compared to zero in the um, classical hemolytic transfusion reaction group. And as expected, there was more antibodies um, identified in the hemolytic transfusion reaction group compared to hyperhemolysis group. So I'm just going to do a couple of cases now. So this was a case we had here, I think, a year ago. So this was a 17-year-old female hemoglobin SS who had recently moved to the UK from Italy and had a history of recurrent admissions with acute pain. She'd had um, previous chest syndrome as well, but no sort of end organ damage or the organ problems as far as she was aware. In terms of her transfusion history, she said she'd had three previous episodes of transfusion as all the sort of top up simple transfusions. And she described that the last transfusion she had four years ago resulted in a severe reaction and she was advised to avoid further transfusion. Um, so she was admitted to one of the local hospitals quite soon after she arrived in the UK with a VOC with leg and arm pain and she was treated with opiate analgesia. And her haemoglobin at the time of admission was 67 and her baseline haemoglobin was 75, so not too far from a baseline. So um, usually we would definitely not recommend transfusion in a simple VOC case, but it was decided to give her two units of blood um, and it, this improved haemoglobin level to 96 and then she was discharged. And then, as you would expect, um, she was readmitted 10 days later with all over body pain, fever, and a haemoglobin of 45 and evidence of haemoglobinuria and we were contacted um, and we advised to treat for um, a potential delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction or hyperhemolysis so she was given immunoglobulin and steroid and we advised to avoid further transfusion and we advised to give hematinic so she got folic acid and b12 and epo and, and oral iron um, and we advised very close monitoring and we were trying to get her transferred over to our hospital and that just shows her blood, so her ferritin was very high at 15,000, and we requested DAT and antibody screen as well. So we also contacted the red cell reference laboratory, and it was um, after a few discussions with the transfusion team there, um, it was it became aware that the local hospital were not aware of the previous antibody history, and they had picked up an anti-Duffy A antibody, but the patient actually was known to have a Duffy 3 antibody and she'd already had a genotype in Italy which showed she did not have a GAT mutation so she was a true null phenotype um, Duffy A and B negative patient and so um, it was suspected that she was given um, Duffy B units and therefore that's why she'd had this reaction. So in terms of the patient she the next day her pain was um, better and a haemoglobin was stable at around 45 and a fever had settled. However, she had now developed um, an oxygen requirement and we were told she had no sort of chest signs or symptoms for oxygen saturation. We were a bit on the low side at 94% of room air. Um, so we advised very close monitoring and to try and get the patient to a high dependency bed. And I think the team at the time thought we were being a little bit um, overcautious because she, she didn't seem too unwell, but we were very concerned that she might develop a chest syndrome. Um, so we, we advised to treat her with antibiotics and ensure she was doing regular incentive spirometry and make sure her pain was well controlled. And we also contacted the transfusion 
um, RCI team again to make sure we did have some duffy A and B units in case we did need to give blood. So I think the following day, early hours of the morning, we got a call that she had acutely deteriorated and the sats were now 85% on room air and she'd become very tachycardic. The medical reg at the time said her chest was still clear, but hemoglobin had continued to drop and was now 35. So she was having ongoing hemolysis. So it's very difficult um, to decide what was the best course of action at this point, whether to give her blood or whether to treat her for ongoing hemolysis. Um, so we we advised to get urgently transferred to critical care and to to give eculizumab for the severe hemolysis. But also, I thought at this point we are going to have to give her some blood just because she was quite symptomatic there. With um, I, I thought she was developing a chest syndrome as well, even though they were. I was told the chest was clear. And we said to get an urgent repeat um, chest X-ray as well. So then we were actually called back within sort of 90 minutes, and she'd actually become really unwell and um, was intubated and ventilated due to respiratory failure um, and she was requiring 100% FiO2. She wasn't acidotic at this point but the repeat chest x-ray showed sort of complete whiteout up to the mid zones the ITU consultant had told me. Um, she'd not yet had the blood or the ecolutumab so we said to just give it all basically so she got the ecolutumab and then straight after we gave the blood unfortunately she didn't have an acute um, reaction we were asking them to monitor closely and so we recommended to give the second unit of blood as well so her condition was very critical the itu team spoke to the family and, and said you know be prepared for the worst she might not survive this because she was on such high amounts of oxygen and just complete respiratory failure um, and then after those two units of blood hemoglobin was still 45 and there wasn't any evidence of sort of ongoing hemolysis um, and so we recommended to give another unit of blood at this point. Um, so the following day, hemoglobin was 61, so that was quite reassuring, but the condition was still the same, so she was just um, completely reliant on respiratory support. So I think because the hemoglobin was now at a reasonable level, we said let's just hold off further blood transfusion and continue with supportive ICU care, and she did slowly start to improve over the next sort of 48 hours, and oxygen requirements did slowly come down. So we were very lucky with this case as she continued to make daily improvement and she was extubated and transferred back to the ward and a haemoglobin um, improved further to 75 and she was discharged um, the following week. So very um, lucky this patient really. Okay, and then the second case is a 48 year old female, again, haemoglobin SS. She had a history of sickle nephropathy, hypertension and recurrent leg ulcers and her baseline hemoglobin is 75 and she had moved to Manchester in 2018 and she was admitted to hospital with a painful non-healing um, leg ulcer. Now this was before I would took up the post initially so it, the timing's a bit it was a bit difficult to get all the details but it sounded like she was um, at the SHT. It was decided that we were going to arrange a one-off elective exchange transfusion because of this severe leg ulcer. Um, but before she came for that elective exchange, she was admitted to one of the local hospitals um, again due to leg ulcer and a lot of pain. And the, the medical team there transfused two units of blood. And then she then came the month later to the um, to, to our hospital for the the planned exchange and a haemoglobin had dropped down at that point from 100 to 66 and I don't think anybody at either site was aware that the patient was also having transfusion at the other hospital so just basically a case of hospitals not talking to each other very well. She was then readmitted to the local hospital the following month again and now a haemoglobin had dropped down to 43 and it was picked up she had now developed multiple alloantibodies and also a panreactive autoantibody um, but it wasn't really flagged up to anyone that this needs to be treated any differently than a low haemoglobin and she was just transfused with more blood. Um, she was then admitted again in May again with a low haemoglobin and she was just transfused again another three units and the last these last two admissions with the medical teams they hadn't spoke to anyone from haematology so it, it was quite clear she was having an ongoing hemolytic transfusion reaction and they were just treating it with blood each time. So. We were finally called um, because the haemoglobin was 41. The medical team 
rang to say to hematology, why is this patient, why is the hemoglobin not improving? So um, despite them giving so many blood transfusions, she had developed dark urine as well. So we were contacted at this point by the local hematology team and we advised to definitely stop transfusing and to give immunoglobulin and steroid and we transferred her over to our hospital. So this just shows the time, the first timeline, bear with me, there's quite a few timelines for this patient. So she, she when she arrived to our hospital, the hemoglobin had dropped down to 33. We give her immunoglobulin and steroid. And the hemoglobin did come up quite nicely to 60 and she was clinically improving and we were quite happy that she was hopefully going to be going home. But then she did start to become unwell again. She had some complications with urosepsis and C. diff infection as well. And then by the by the end of the month, the hemoglobin had dropped back down to 43 again. So it was it was sort of a month later from the first course of IVIG. So we said she needed to have a, a second course of immunoglobulin and steroid. And then I think it was about a week later, hemoglobin had improved, but then she developed all over body pains and fevers and a CRP um, was going up as well. And then two days later, hemoglobin dropped down to 37 again. So she was, um, she basically had developed a sort of chest syndrome. She had bivasal crackles and she was transferred to critical care. And we had to give her a unit of blood because she was very anemic. Um, and again, this just shows her antibodies at the time. So she had a, a big C, a little E related antibody and a JKB and a panreactive auto antibody as well. Um, the patient was B positive and was known to be an E variant from the genotype. Um, so NHSB consultants discussed the case and they, they did find four units in the country that they thought were um, suitable, but we, we would we tried to obviously hold off if we unless we had to. So we gave her one unit with further methyl pred cover. So she did recover from the chest syndrome and hemoglobin came up. But then by the 18th of July, hemoglobin had dropped down again to 36. And she had again developed fever and pain. So it's like each time the hemoglobin dropped down, she was getting very unwell with it with fevers and pain. And we gave her a third course of IVIG and prednisolone. Um, and at this point, we decided to keep her on steroid because we thought she was almost behaving like a sort of autoimmune hemolysis and there was an autoantibody present as well. So we we kept her on steroid at this point, but she, each time she responded very well to the IVIG. Um, but I think that within a few days, we she was quite hemodynamically unstable, so we had to give her a further unit of blood. And by this time, we thought we we're going to have to start some other treatment. Um, and this was before the commissioning criteria for ecolizumab, and because we thought it was sort of like a an autoimmune hemolytic anemia overlap hyperhemolysis, we decided to go with rituximab. And so this graph just shows the ups and downs of her hemoglobin and the black arrows just when we gave each course of IVIG and you can see she responded to that each time. And then the reds where we had to give her a transfusion and the green is the steroid and then the rituximab is the purple. And as you can see after the rituximab, her hemoglobin did come up quite or appeared to come up quite nicely uh, with the combination of the high dose steroid. So we, we thought we had finally got somewhere. So she had the last dose of rituximab and then we slowly started to wean the steroids. But then unfortunately, the following month, um, the hemoglobin had dropped down again to 34. And this was over the course of sort of six to nine months now. So this patient had been in hospital. There was lots of social issues I should have mentioned and she was there was difficulty getting her home in between times anyway. Um, but she, she then went on and had a fifth course of IVIG and a hemoglobin went as low as 27. Um, and so we decided at the, in November to start her on mycophenolate as further immunosuppression. Um, and it, it wasn't very clear by then if, if it was the steroids had started to work or whether the mycophenolate had worked, but she did start to maintain a decent hemoglobin within the next couple of months. And I'll just show you again the graph again where we gave the um, the blue arrow at the top is where we gave the mycophenolate and then since then she we kept her on mycophenolate for sort of um, I think it was a year in total and, and steroids for a sort of three to six months weaning off them and a hemoglobin fortunately did maintain so I think this case demonstrates a case where there is 
certainly a trigger of the blood certainly seemed to cause the initial hemolytic process but then possibly an auto antibody developed and she developed this sort of autoimmune hemolytic anemia type picture so that's it really so i think the key points are that transfusion remains a key intervention and can be life-saving however the decision to transfuse can be very challenging and requires careful consideration of the risks and benefits and it's important to establish a full transfusion history um, and find out from as many people as possible from the patient, the previous trust and the laboratories. It's a real multidisciplinary approach to make sure um, get as much inf information as possible because mistakes can happen. Human error does occur. Um, and avoiding aluminization should be a priority. And I think the shot report every year highlights all the errors that occur with incorrect blood given and avoidable transfusion as well. And all suspected cases of hemolytic transfusion should be reported with as much detail as possible to help us analyse and help um, help our understanding to help improve care as well. And that is the end. Thank you very much. Any questions? If you don't have a mic, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Any questions um, at all? Oh, I've got a quick question. Sorry. Just yes, Sally. Look out to raise my hand. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Thanks for uh, the Hi, presentation. Gosh. It's really interesting. Um, quite scary patients. Um, so uh, glad they both did well. When you're deciding on the rituximab dose, I noticed that you used the 375 mig per cake initially and then went for 100. W which dose would you tend to use, either in the treatment or prophylaxis of um, hemolytic transfusion reaction? Good question, Claire. I think I forgot we we changed dose actually. I think the, the commission in policy says 375, which is sort of the same as the the, the dose that the malignant team uses, isn't it? But I think we went for 100 just because that's what um, is for the autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I mean, we I think we've used it on one other patient and I've not had great results with it. Um, with either dose really um yeah i mean we used it it's in the guidance it's, it's it's there for second line for prevention isn't it whereas we actually used it up front as a sort of treatment for the for the hyperhemolysis so it wouldn't strictly fit in with the, the criteria that we used it for at the time but there wasn't any commission criteria when we used it um, yeah yeah and I, you know i appreciate um you know obviously it takes a few weeks to work usually yeah. And when we use yeah. it for ITP, you know, I know in our centre we're not entirely consistent between the 375 and then thinking, well, yeah. you know, there's some evidence the 100 might be as effective as yeah. ITP, but, you know, I don't think there's really going to be that sort of data for, for the sickle oh. patients and the hematic transfusion reaction. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Sally? Oh, thanks, um, Joe. Just a quick question about the first um, lady who um, was really sick in ICU, kind of almost touch and go, really. Did It was just a, a silly question, probably, but did the ICU team consider ECMO at all for her if oxidation was a big problem? Um, they didn't mention it. We did have a, we had another patient who, who ended up on ECMO. Um, I know that hospital doesn't do ECMO. Um, it's just but no, they didn't, they didn't mention no. it. Because I just, I think, you know, it's, it's, it seems so, such a quick, horrible deterioration in a person who yeah. was previously quite well. I, I just wonder whether we need to be thinking about it, because it, it, ECMO is very much a regional provision, isn't it? But I wish yeah. you would need to be transferred out, or or sometimes the ECMO team will come and do ECMO in, in the local hospital if the patient's too sick to transfer. But it's just, I guess it's another mode. She just, it, when you said she was touch and go, I was just like, oh my goodness, you know how your kind of emotions go up when you're listening to the case. Yeah. Um, now that's yeah. a really good point actually i think yeah i think that's something we probably need to consider isn't it because i think well we know which center it will be here where the patients will be transferred to for ecmo um and it definitely well we had, we had a patient who we plasma exchanged last year and andy went on ecmo and he recovered so i think anything we can do to help them sort of recover so yeah i think something to think about isn't it for yeah. future cases definitely thanks yeah thank you Are there any other questions? 
No, okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We do have a feedback survey. Um, the link is just there. If you could give us some feedback about how you found the session this afternoon, it would be really appreciated. Also, to open the link, you do need to open it in Google Chrome um, and then it should work for you. The next national session will be on collation in thalassemia and I've also attached a link there as well. If you'd like to join that event, that event will be run by the Red Cell Network down in London. If you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me or Dr. Sharif and we'll do our best to answer those. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording now and thank you again, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Thank you.